We're here with Mike Erie. Mike is the pastor of Rock Harbor Church in Costa Mesa, California, a church of 3,000. And yep. Mike, it's great to have you. Thanks for being with us. Oh, I'm delighted to be with you guys. Mike, God is doing some amazing things at Rock Harbor, and I think yep. all over churches like you have that appeal to maybe a little bit younger person. I mean, talk about what God is doing in terms of bringing people to himself in a new and refreshing way. I think the thing that we see that is so fascinating is in the midst of all of the talk of postmodernism and how churches are changing and ministry is changing, we just find that younger folks particularly just have a deep thirst for truth, unadorned, unapologized for, unashamedly expressed, and then embodied. They want to see it in your life that you were passionate about it. And it has been amazing to see what that combination does in the lives of young people who come looking for answers these days. Well, Mike, as you have so many young people getting passionate about Christ, mm -hmm. it would seem to me then that Satan is even a little bit more passionate about getting oh, them yes. distracted. Absolutely. And, there, and it's not for lack of distractions these days and in the culture in which we live. One of the things that we have to constantly remind our students about is that there is more to this life than just what you see. You know, there's the, uh, the scriptures speak of the earthly realm, the realm that you can get at with your senses. But the scriptures talk so much about the spiritual realm, the realm uh, that is more important in scripture's eyes, where the real action takes place. That's kind of the behind the scenes part of this, the stage drama that we see played out before us. And here and now, of course, we see uh, all of the carnage and all of the, all of the results of what's going on behind the scenes. Well, let's talk about this for a second, because I think a lot of times people's concept about Satan and the forces of evil is that it's really just kind of figurative or it's kind of fiction, and, and don't we sometimes even trivialize it? You know, we dress oh, yeah. up little kids at Halloween yep, yep. with the little horns and the right. pitchfork and the pointed right. tail, and they look like a little, you know, Cupid gone bad, yes. you know, and they're going from <laughs> house to house. Yeah. Or we think that it's the things that makes good movies. Yep. But oftentimes, don't Christians think, well, maybe it doesn't even really exist? So oh, absolutely. I think, I think a lot of folks find themselves caught between one of two extremes. On the one hand, there are those of us who are very frightened by this, who either because of the Hollywood uh, portrayals of Satan or just uh, something that they've been taught, perhaps, see demonic influence behind every, every bad thing that happens to them, every speeding ticket or auto accident or what have you. But then on the other side of the equation, we've got folks that you're talking about who we either are trivializing this thing or are just ignoring it altogether. I mean, the scriptures are quite clear. Satan is no myth. He is quite real. He is big. He is bad. He's not, of course, the opposite of God or the equal of God, but he exists. And in fact, Peter compares him to a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So our goal uh, at Rock Harbor, and I think what Scripture does, is just to allow people to have a healthy awareness of who he is and what he does, but not be afraid of him, for in Christ we have complete victory over him. Hmm. And we've talked about that God has got attributes, and that God has a personality, and Satan, he's got attributes, yes. he's got a personality, yes. and I mean, the more we know about what Satan is like, doesn't that give us more knowledge of how we can deal with him? But Absolutely. talk about what, what this boy is like. I mean, this yeah. is not good stuff. I mean, he is his titles aren't real happy right. titles like right. God's, are they? No, not at all. Before we even get to his titles, I think it's just important to recognize that Satan is a created being. Mm. He's a fallen angel. He was, he was once named Lucifer. Mm. And as a created being, Satan is subject to the will of God. In fact, you see that in the book of Job. Satan has to actually ask permission uh, in front of God's throne to, to do the work that he wanted to do. Satan is an intelligent being, a being with will, a being with intellect, a very, uh, uh, intellect, excuse me, a very strong being, but is certainly not God's equal, as we've already said. Scripture gives, gives him titles that describe his work against us and his activity that give us insight into his character. One of those is just the deceiver. He's called that in John chapter 8 by Jesus. In fact, Jesus says he is a liar from the beginning, and he is the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. And so one of the ways that believers must learn to recognize the work of Satan are those whisperings that seem contrary to what God has said in his word, what God is doing in our life. In fact, when, he, when Satan approached 
Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he approached them not with some demonic display of fireworks, but just the whispering of a false idea about God. So he is known as the deceiver. He's also known as the tempter. That comes from 1 Thessalonians, that he presents temptations. He knows us. He, does, he can't see inside of us, of course. He's not everywhere, and he doesn't see everything. But by observing us, Satan can learn where our weaknesses are and just allow things kind of to fall into place, particularly when lying to us and presenting false ideas about God, that leads us naturally then to being tempted. If we don't believe that God is good, for instance, we might look to relieve stress or to deal with the bad things of life in other ways. The third title he's given is that of the accuser. In Revelation chapter 12, he is described as the accuser of the brethren, Christians, who sits before God accusing them day and night. And there's an interesting progression here. He lies to us to get us to believe false things. He tempts us then to act on that false belief. And then once we've acted and sinned against God, he sits pointing a finger at us, accusing us before God himself and accusing our own conscious, our own conscious um, consciences against us. And in so doing, he discourages the people of God. He seeks to defeat them. And what what he's really after, what he's really after in this, the war is already won. And the natural question is, why does he keep fighting? If he knows he's lost, if he knows God is God, why does he keep fighting? Well, in John chapter 10, there is a very famous verse that Christians are apt to quote frequently. And it just simply says this, Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And we quote that a lot, but we usually don't quote the first part of the verse, which says, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And there Jesus is talking of the work of Satan. So Jesus' project in our lives is to give us life, eternal life, a different kind of life here and now. The work of Satan, on the other hand, is to rob that life from us. Now, Paul talks about how he blinds the eyes of unbelievers in this age to keep them from knowing Christ. But one of the things he also does is that once you accept Christ, it's almost as if you put a different kind of target on your back, and he seeks to oppose what Jesus wants to do in us and through us. Well, what do we as Christians do then? Uh, Let's say I'm a new Christian. Uh, I'm I'm hearing you say these things about Satan. Maybe I was kind of aware of it before. I'm feeling these spiritual struggles man, I'm not capable of fighting them on my own. No, and How that, do I do it? Boy, I think you just nailed the first thing. Just to recognize that we do not have in our own strength, power, intellect, the ability to take on Satan and fight him in our own strength and power. First of all, we have to understand most of all that Jesus Christ has won the battle for us. Colossians uh, chapters 1 and 2 describes how that has taken place. Paul also talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 that we have spiritual armor that equips us to fight against Satan in all the ways that he seeks to steal the life Jesus has for us. But in James chapter 4 verse 7, James gives us kind of an interesting insight in what this really looks like. He says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that is a handy way that I've tried to remember how it is that I am to deal with the evil one. We're to be aware of him, but not to be unduly frightened of him. And because of that victory, we can submit ourselves to God, resist him, and he will flee. How do we submit ourselves to God? Well, we should not give Satan footholds in our lives. Paul talks in Ephesians about, do not let the sun go down in your anger and give the evil one a foothold. There are footholds we give him when we sin consistently, and it's almost as if we're giving Satan permission then to have power in our lives. So we submit ourselves to God. We repent from those things, confess them. The resisting part that James talks about, I think really has to do with Scripture. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Jesus responded by quoting Scripture back at Satan. And one of the ways we resist, particularly his lies, is that we are to marinate, so to speak, our minds in the truth of God's Word. And when we hear those either accusations, when we hear those temptations or those deceptions, we respond with Scripture and the truth of God's Word against those. Well, this has been great. Mike, I know you've, you've, um, you've got a church of, of 3,000 people, and God has entrusted you with that. And I think also as we, as we think about what God wants for us, He wants us to be close to Him. He wants Amen. us to be buried in His Word. He wants us to resist the devil. I mean, these are commands that He's given us. Yeah. And if you could just give a, a new believer, if they came into your office uh, and, and just said, Pastor, I mean, I, I feel like Satan is coming after me. I mean, is there, is there something that you would send them off? I mean, besides the things we've talked about here sure. today, 
that would really give them maybe just again one final verse or word of encouragement yeah. so that people who are, are struggling with this and again I would think that Satan one thing about passion of the Christ that really yeah. got to me was that he's interested in preventing people from knowing Christ just yeah. in just a few seconds just give a word of encouragement I would say this most importantly to learn who you are in Jesus Christ once you've accepted him and have been born again you are his son his daughter you are justified you are adopted you have been redeemed I mean the biblical words for this are amazing and none of them indicate that they can be reversed and I would just have you camp in Romans chapter 8 where Paul says towards the end of that chapter that nothing can separate you from the love of God not angels nor demons demons, nor death itself. And I think that is the encouragement, that the battle is won, and we have tools to fight with. Mike Geary, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Appreciate guys. it, brother. Thank God you bless so you. It's great to tell that you're passionate about these <laughs> things because you're passionate about your love for Christ. Amen. Thank you, guys.